600 years ago, Christians went to church and they learned to destroy manuscripts. And we see in this manuscript here, the hours of Blanche of Savoy, made in the 14th century, that the clergy here are kissing a number of objects, including a book and a pax. And in the process of kissing these objects, they pretty much destroyed them. So here, for example, I'm showing you a pax, which has been kissed so vigorously and so enthusiastically that all of the surface detail has been worn right off of the bas relief. And the priest also would kiss this book called a missal, which contains all of the texts that the priest would need to read in order to perform the mass. And in the process of doing that, he would also kiss the book. And you can see that he's kissed the body of Christ here to the point where the paint is worn down to the parchment. And possibly he's nibbled the corner a little bit here as well. <laughs> so. We can see here just how worn this all looks, how much spittle has accumulated on this opening as it's lain there on the altar. And the problem was, of course, that in the process of kissing manuscripts over and over again during the mass, that the priest would destroy them. Now, artists realized that, that the simple use would result in the destruction of books, and so they came up with a solution. And that solution that artists came up with is this object right here, which is called the osculatory plaque, or kiss target. Now the object, the purpose of this object is so that priest can aim his lips <laughs> at the kiss target, thereby preventing damage to the book itself. So this is an abstract shape designed to protect the book from the priest's over-enthusiastic love for the painting depicted here in the book. But as we can see in various examples of late medieval missals, the priest wasn't so interested in kissing this abstract target, and his lips would creep up the shaft <laughs> of the cross and smear Christ across the landscape to the point where some manuscripts, such as this one, and I just have to tell you here, this was, this was commissioned by a baker's guild, so there's a little man putting bread in the bottom margin here uh, in an oven. Uh, but this book was commissioned by a baker's guild, and it was, it's extremely lavish, and it has a golden osculatory target, but you can see that the priest has avoided this and instead has smeared Christ's groin and chest across the landscape. But you can't really blame him because all that metal is like kissing someone with braces. <laughs> and this book also has an osculatory target that has been avoided, but this time for a different reason. So this image was inserted into a different kind of book altogether. This is a book of civic oaths that was written and still kept in the city of Sertogenbos, I had to get my tonsils out to say that, um, <laughs> and that is where Hieronymus Bosch came from. But this book of civic oaths was laid on a, a table, not an altar, but just a civic table, and then oath swearers would put one hand on the book and swear the oaths that are copied inside it. You can see just how smeared the book has become after being used for this purpose for a number of decades. Now, I want to come back to the Blanche of Savoy for a second to make a second point, which is that this image also has an audience. So Blanche of Savoy herself is standing at the altar and she's holding a book and she is also going to imitate what the priest is doing with his book. And it looks as if she could almost lift up her book and kiss it herself. But that's precisely what other people did with their books. This belonged to Philip the Bold, and he had an image inserted into his prayer book with an osculatory plate below. So he wasn't a priest, he was a duke. And you can see that there's just a little bit of mild kissing here. But later on in the same book, we see the pages he really liked. And <laughs> 
he had no fewer than five images of the Vera icon, the true likeness of Christ, stuck into his book, and he has pawed them completely um, and kissed the face to the point where the paint is chipped right off. So in this, we can say that, that this practice of kissing the image of Christ went from the priesthood to the noble class to uh, regular uh, upper-class book owners, such as the one who owned this book made in Harlem around 1475. And you can see that, that this lay book owner has kissed the face of Christ. And in this quite beautiful image, uh, this book from Bruges, uh, also made in the 15th century, the owner has, has used a rather moist technique to kiss Christ, which has caused the blue paint from the facing folio to stick to the body when the book gets closed, and it makes Christ look a little like a, a blue Dalmatian. <laughs> now, this idea that to love something means to kiss it to bits carries over into other kinds of devotional images. And I show you this uh, book of, of sacred poetry, all written in red here, with a facing image, or a former image, of the Virgin, and she's been kissed down to the underdrawing right out of veneration. Now, all of these images here demonstrate to us the emotional charge of pictures and the emotional appeal that they had to their owners, and also the fact that they're on skin. Parchment, which medieval books were copied on, is made from animal skin. So these books show us inadvertent stories about how people had emotional responses to pictures and how they, they document the skin-on-skin -skin contact uh, from the past. Now, this dirt and the skin-on-skin -skin contact in manuscripts is, uh, is really present here. You can see that in this uh, prayer book, this area down here has been encrusted with hand juice from layers and layers of copying. And, but what's really interesting about this book is that deeper in the same book, you can see it's the same kind of decoration, the same kind of script, but this folio here on the right hasn't been used nearly as much as the other one. And so we could say that the owner of this book, the reader, really used that text, liked that text a lot, and was ah, meh about the other one. And I wanted to find out if we could quantify those dirt levels and see what people were reading, what people had an emotional response to. So to do that, I used this manuscript, a book of hours made in Delft around 1440 as a guinea pig. And here you see six different openings from this book. You can see that there are different amounts of dirt in the corners. This has quite a bit, here's a lot. Here's a little less. I want to see if you could quantify these, these, these words, more than, less than, and so forth. So I looked around and found this gizmo called a densitometer, which measures the optical density of a reflecting surface. Zero the scale at the top of the page where nobody would, would handle the book, and then took a reading from the juiciest part of the fingerprint down below, and then logged these numbers into a graph, and you can instantly see which parts were read. So here are the folio numbers, the page numbers down the side, uh, and then the dirt meter, dirtometer reader, uh, from the, uh, up, the, up the side, and then the chapters of the book, the different sections of the book uh, delineated in red. And so you can see that the text that was most read is the Hours of the Virgin. Now this uh, has the largest area under the curve. This is a text to be read from early in the morning in little segments till late at night. But what you can also see is at the end of the day, around 10 o'clock at night, the uh, the, the text, the, the graph really falls off. So we might suggest that this person fell asleep about a third of the time before finishing the text. Now, here is another graph from a different book of ours, and you can see it has a completely different pattern, this time with these sharp spikes. And these spikes, it turns out, correspond to the pictures in the book. Here's a person who used the book primarily just to paw the pictures. Although we can say that he was also literate, he could read, because there's some area, some elevation under the graph here at 
areas of text only. But the, the page that he liked the most with the highest spike here is a picture of himself. So the picture he kept turning back to over and over again is an image of himself with his coats of arms and he's looking at St. Jerome who's looking at the cross and he couldn't get enough of this image. <laughs> now here is a graph from a third book of ours and this time yet another shape. Here is someone who primarily read it uh, for the penitential psalms and then two prayers, one to St. Adrian and the other to St. Sebastian. And here you see the incipit pages of those particular texts. Now, St. Sebastian here, he was ventilated with arrows as his martyrdom, and these arrow wounds resembled bubos from the bubonic plague. So he was venerated against bubonic plague. So we can suggest that the owner of this book had a severe anxiety about bubonic plague or contracting it, and read this text over and over again, possibly to prevent it. Um, but on the other hand, here's a folio where there's almost no activity. Um, and this is a prayer to Saint Apollonia. Now she was a female virgin martyr saint and her martyrdom was to have her teeth ripped out of her mouth by a, 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 a deranged dentist. And people uh, would venerate her for dental pain and mouth pain of all sorts. So we can say that the owner of this book feared the plague but had very good teeth. <laughs> now, all of this suggests that medieval manuscripts can tell us something about our lives now. Namely, that, well, it's important to remember that, that print culture, which we're currently abandoning as we, as we adopt screen culture, is quite different from manuscript culture. So print culture on paper, uh, don't touch the book too much, you're not supposed to write on them. Uh, whereas manuscript culture invites this interaction with the book and this skin just uh, invites us to touch it and to leave our deposits. We might even say that medieval people reveled in the possibility of leaving their mark in the book, their cumulative marks of wear, in order to demonstrate their long-standing commitment to certain texts, to certain images. And we might even think about uh, the, the fact that when we use uh, iPhones and iPads and smartphones and all of these things that we have to touch, that we're having, we're experiencing now an unrequited love for the tangible object, the tangible act of reading, which is lost in, uh, in translation, lost in our screen culture, and that in fact, we're really yearning uh, to be medievals again.